Today's topic is making cover crops work in areas with less than 20 inches of rainfall. And uh, it's something I've been wanting to do for a while, and maybe you could say I've been hesitating a little bit because those of you know that uh, I live in southeastern Pennsylvania. And full disclaimer, we actually get double that. We actually get 40 inches of rainfall, so that's my personal experience. That may seem like I'm unqualified to have this talk. I get that. Uh, that being said, I've been to uh, dry land areas uh, around the world, and I have been uh, observing what goes on there. And the nice thing about it is there certainly are principles in cover cropping that do apply literally worldwide, no matter what your precept is, anywhere from 10 inches annual to over 100 inches annual. I've seen cover crops working in all those scenarios. And I like to remind my dry land friends that just because I get 40 inches of rain a year doesn't mean that's all just glory because being too wet sometimes can be just as as detrimental as being too dry. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put that out there right up front here that uh, uh, that's where I'm coming from and I do I would I'm, I'm looking forward to some folks I see on here that could maybe uh, chime in later on at the end and um, and comment and so forth on on this on this topic because uh, I'm sure there'll be some good ideas that can be shared so you ask the question well how can you grow cover crops in in a low rainfall area they take up moisture right well yeah they do take up moisture but What's our option? Is this our only option? Uh, you see this picture here of uh, basically fallow tilled soil. Um, and <clears throat> this happened to be in Australia. I'm going to draw heavily on Australia today because that's where most of my experience has been <clears throat> in dry land areas. And I've been up to uh, Derrick's region and other people, uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Western uh, U.S., over in Eastern Europe. I've been in areas that have had less that, that average less than 20 inches of rainfall. So, you know, you look at this picture here and uh, knowing the, the group that I'm talking to, you're like, well, that, you know, it's definitely not what we want to see. Um, so how do we grow cover crops and what is the point of growing cover crops in a low rainfall environment? And uh, it's, it's, it's against the backdrop of the question, can, I use available moisture to be able to grow a plant that may not help my cash crop. <clears throat> well, let's let's look let's look at um, first of all. I just mentioned before I even go down this list here. What what does nature do when when you leave nature go? Even in dry areas there tends to be some plants uh, growing. So we know that it is indeed possible. So some of the key concepts here for low rainfall areas, and and, and I'll just say a lot of these you've seen before for uh, other areas, but uh, there's some of the ones that I came up with here. And maybe, <clears throat> I'm not saying this is the most important, but it's certainly one of the most important there, feeding the biology of the soil. I think we're finding out now that that is huge in the long-term uh, investment in our soils is to feed that biology, and you have to use plants to do that. Um, yes, you can bring in compost, and you can bring in different amendments and stuff, but that's that works in certain situations, but that's cost prohibitive, and it's just not available in a lot of areas. So having the option... It, it brings us back to the only option then of, of growing plants because we know that that works. And if we can, of course, manage for the diversity of the species, and I'm going to say not just in cover crops but also in cash crops as well. Uh, a soil doesn't know if a plant is a cash crop or a cover crop. So if we can have diverse species, uh, that is definitely going to – build a foundation of success and I, I I'll just point out again um, the the Derek Axton is on here from Saskatchewan 
is uh, using companion cropping or multi-species cash crops growing together. And that's a kind of a new area of growing, of farming. And uh, and he's in a dry area. And I, I'm, I'm trying to mimic some of those things even on my farm where I can. So the diversity of species is very, very important to make this work. And then here's what flies in the face of conventional wisdom having something growing year round because agriculture has evolved in the dry land areas to save the moisture for the cash crop. And there, there's, you know, just from a, a theoretical viewpoint, that may seem like the way to go. But now looking at what we know now and the effectiveness of biology, and I would say building a building case studies, if you will, of farmers who are successful in using cover crops in low fall areas are indeed growing, trying to grow something year round. And so what are the benefits we get out of this? Well, uh, some of it is keeping the soil cooler. Just because we have a plant growing there, it literally blocks the sun and keeps the soil cooler through shading. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about temperatures later on and how that affects soil life, but I'll just leave that for now. And then, of course, the big one here is water management. Um, I'm just going to go through these, and we're going to discuss them a little bit more broadly later, but uh, water infiltration, being able to capture uh, the rain as it falls from the sky, being able to hold the water that falls, limiting erosion from wind or from water, and then also limiting evapotranspiration. So uh, these are some of the things that are, are really, really important. And it does vary. That last one there varies depending on what part of the latitude you are. And um, as we were discussing before we came on here, uh, it makes a difference if you're in northern latitudes versus southern latitudes. The intensity of the sun and all that does indeed have a role in how this all works out. So uh, I think, first of all, at the outset here, I want to just make a comment, and I, I just put this slide in here about adjusting expectations in dry areas. I uh, would have to say that it is there is more management that comes into play when you're working in a dry land environment, you could say it's a little less forgiving. Um, I'm not sure if it's more risky. I didn't want to put that in there. It's only more risky if you don't know what you're doing. So that's, I just kind of want to mention that. Uh, so, you know, when you're in, the, when you're in dry land, less than 20 inches of rainfall, uh, you know, to, to be able to make this work, it's not going to be a cookie cutter approach. And this, this applies to any cover cropping, but more so with working in dry land areas. And, and I'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through, but, uh, I just think to, it's to, to be fair to the topic, uh, adjusting expectations, I think is important because the dry land areas essentially mostly have not been the leaders of the cover crop movement. Uh, however, that being said, those in those areas, there's beginning to now emerge a group of I'm going to call very top level manager type farmers that are indeed making it work. So again, just a little perspective here uh, on on um, on my approach to all this and 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 my approach to the topic today. So I've uh, been to Australia a couple times. Uh, this is Josh Walters in uh, southeastern Australia. He said a statement that I've used frequently. Those of you who have heard me speak live have probably seen this slide. His comment is, in Australia, we need to build a bigger bucket. And that is directly applied to the soil's ability to capture and retain water. And uh, so he says every drop of water that falls out of the sky we want to capture it and we want to hold it as long as possible. And the way we do that is with no soil disturbance, 
cover crops, diversity, and living roots. So I just listed four basic things there. We apply that to almost every single aspect of cover cropping. But here again, it applies to low rainfall areas. And I think um, there's a couple other things here, too. I just want to lay the case out for how this works. But um, it's a long-term commitment. And again, it applies to cover cropping in general, but maybe more so in the context of dry land, because there are some years where, frankly, it's just too dry to even get a cover crop to germinate. And I can talk all day here, but if it's too dry to get it to germinate, it ain't happening. So I get that. I understand that. But it's about being an opportunist, and I'm going to share a few of those things coming up. So the whole long-term commitment really, really does apply uh, to this conversation. And when I say long-term, I'm saying minimal 10 years. Uh, if, if you're going into cover cropping and you're in a dry land environment, you want to have essentially a 10-year plan. And I'm not saying that you have every year figured out. What I'm saying is you are looking at this as a long-term commitment to make this work. Um, so that's just an overview of, uh, of going into the discussion. Uh, some more specifics now, uh, mentioned soil temperatures. I, I want to thank the, uh, the Burley County Conservation District from North Dakota for some of these pictures, uh, that area. I, I was, I think I was really, I guess you would say, uh, 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 learned about more of the dry land cover cropping when I spoke for their meeting in 2007, I think it was in, in North Dakota. And, and that was, for, for me, it was really informative to see the, some of the work they were doing there in this low rainfall environment. So there's just a picture there of in the summer. And, and I'm assuming that's, that's probably uh, an inch or two into the soil. Uh, right there's a, a 20 degree difference in the soil temperature. And I mean, you might, you might say that's not that high there, but when you look at, a scientific uh, viewpoint management of it. Uh, again, I, I'm going to credit the Burley County Conservation District for this for these this information. At 140 de degrees, uh, the soil bacteria they die, um, and as the temperature is lower, there is an increasingly available moisture is used for growth, and that just is common sense. But this is the data. We kind of know this, but with, but if you can keep your soil 10, 20, 30 degrees cooler, you're going to do a lot for keeping your soil life alive. And that's why we can see some benefits that sometimes I could argue take, take the place of the moisture that we use up as a cover crop. Um, and just the fact that a cover crop uses up moisture, it gives that back because the next rain that falls, every drop is going to infiltrate into it. So the whole moisture, uh, I guess you'd say concern, uh, is, is, is a real concern, but it comes back to management. Um, I, I, I thought about calling it the moisture myth, but I thought that may be a little too strong because you got to be a really good manager here and you got to pay attention to the weather cycles that you may have that are historically natural in your area. Um, but if you can keep that temperature lower, and I think this is one of the keys that cover crops do, because that picture I showed you of the bare soil, I mean, I've seen readings of soil on the top one inch that's well over 140 degrees uh, on a very, very hot day. And it's basically cooking everything to death. So you could just use an analogy that uh, the, the soil life in the soil is not much different than you and I as human beings. Uh, once it gets over 100 degrees, things go downhill pretty quick. And uh, so that's, that's again, just a, a good analogy I feel that we can use here when we think about what we're doing to our soil when our soil is not covered. And I just uh, – Honestly, I know enough farmers who are doing this that there's I, – I, I can't think of a good reason to do uh, fallow, uh, fallow um, 
you know, situation in any given crop rotation. So, um, now I teased you a little bit in some of my promos for this here about the driest uh, area in the world that are successfully growing cover crops. Um, the farmer here, who happens to be the fellow, the fourth one in from the right, uh, with the blue shirt, looks like he might be holding a water con uh, container or something. Uh, he, this is on his farm near Adelaide, Australia. And uh, he, he said, I just have to go on what he said, that they're looking at about an average of a 10-inch rainfall annual uh, is their average, 10 inches in a year. And he made the comment that he thinks he might be the driest farmer in the world growing cover crops. And this is with no irrigation. Uh, so I'll I'll let him stand behind that, but uh, it is a definitely a very, very, very dry area. Now, there's some things to note here on this picture. This is wheat that was harvested about a month before and obviously uses a stripper head. That's a key here. Uh, again, that's to keep the soil covered, and it's also to inherently then also allows the rainwater to infiltrate better. So that was a key component here of his uh, method to all this. Now, if you look close, you can see a little bit of a cover crop coming through. And uh, you'll see this frequently in dry areas. The seeding rates are very low, and that's important. Number one, um, because it's dry, their overall gross yield, gross profit is certainly not as much. So they can't afford to spend a lot of money on covers, but then again, they don't need to. In a case here where they're using the residue of a cash crop to essentially keep the soil covered, and I would say just enough of plant life there to keep the biology going. And uh, sometimes they'll catch a timely rain, and this will really show up nicely. I'm going to show you a picture of that later on. But in this case here, they're trying to keep – he's trying to keep the biology active in his soil so that there can be a lot of benefit there. Now, um, as I always do, I dug a hole. And here is happened to be a radish that was part of the mix that was planted here. And you can just see a little bit of the soil profile. And it was, I mean, if it, if, if you want to use the term bone dry, this would be, this would be it. But, and I was even impressed that that, that radish was even alive. And I couldn't get to the bottom of the root, but there's moisture down there somewhere or it would be dead. Uh, and even though I dug about 18 inches deep. <clears throat> Now, they had moisture sensors that were in this field, and they were doing some research and some actual using cover crops and not using cover crops. They were testing moisture seven, well, it's going to say seven feet or two meters deep, and they had just put them in. So I never really followed up and got the data, but they wanted to learn how this moisture factor works on where cover crops are planted and where they're not. Uh, I know he had said that preliminary data was that there was very little difference uh, between the where there was cover crops and where there wasn't. So <clears throat> uh, this this guy was a couple years into this and obviously pursuing it. He was very positive about it, very upbeat about it. He was just one of those farmers who was that typical uh, uh, mindset of, I am going to make this work. Uh, yep, there's some risk to it, and I have some failures, but I'm going to make it work. And um, so here again, maybe the driest place on earth growing cover crops. Maybe some of you know some other places uh, that are drier, but uh, that's that's uh, that was the story right there. So uh, speaking of techniques that are used, here's stripped wheat. This happens to be in North Dakota, uh, strip, stripper head wheat on the right, leaving the stubble stand so it catches snow. And in northern areas, this is like you got to do this. Um, you just have to or you'll lose that precious moisture in the winter. On the uh, left-hand side there is pea stubble, which was basically spread out low and doesn't catch any snow. So it's not just putting cover crop seed in the ground and it magically works. 
there's there is methods behind this and it's management and i'm going to keep coming back to that that it's you have to manage in the context of the geography that you're in to make this successful <clears throat> the other thing too uh, again that i saw in uh, in australia and i've i've seen it in many areas that are dry land is the use of uh cattle sheep or animals in a grazing situation and just as in any other cover cropping situation if you have this option it's going to make cover crops work even better here they're they're doubling of course as a forage source and um and so this was this was sheep in australia out grazing on uh, primarily it was uh, radishes there so using animals again is maximizing that opportunity <clears throat> some of you may have heard of david cook uh from uh from australia this is on when i was on his farm and he's been doing this for a long time um this is kind of a cool picture here because you can see there was a thunderstorm moving in on the background and uh i, I wanted to show you this because his soil is ready to receive the rain. Now, I don't know exactly what he got, but I would estimate we got a quarter of an inch out of that. And um, unfortunately, I did not have pictures after that, but we walked out in his fields and it just, of course, it all soaked in. It was just, his fields were prepared for that. He had built his bucket, so to speak. And uh, this is one of the one of the leading farmers in Australia that has been using cover crops for quite a few years now. And just to be able to see it working on his farm uh, was, was uh, you know, just gratifying. You, you hear about this stuff, but then you go and you actually see for yourself. So just to go back again to uh, my friend Josh Walters, again in Australia. I had this picture earlier. This picture was taken on a dry spell. They were three months. Uh, I think he only had three inches, I believe, in three months or less than three inches of rain. Sometimes I have to think through the conversion there. But uh, uh, this particular picture here had been sprayed out with glyphosate about two weeks sooner. But you can see uh, not a heavy rate of cover crop, not a lot of growth. Uh, it was very dry. Now, I want to take you to uh, another year. This is also Josh, and he's there in the very middle behind uh, the girl there in the middle back there. This was on that same exact farm. I was there twice. This was a year that had rained, and they had caught some timely rains. And here you can see how that's that's a really really nice cover crop. They were they were just happy as can be with that. And his comment, this is part of his comment of building the bigger bucket, but also maximizing the opportunity. And I think that this is again a mindset that uh, farmers need to have in anywhere in the world, the dry land or, or elsewhere, of maximizing the opportunity. And he's the type of guy, he's going to be planting cover crops pretty much no matter what. And then when you catch that maybe one in four, maybe one in five years where you get an outstanding result because the timing of the rains coincided with the planting of the cover crops, you're going to reap many years of benefits out of a cover crop like this. And that was the message that, that he was sharing that day. So the key is, is be ready. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you my Montana story and right now. Some of you may have heard this, but if, if you know anything about the culture of Montana, you'll appreciate this. Uh, I was uh, met a Montana farmer once at a conference, and uh, this was several years ago. It was a really good summer, and they had quite a bit of rain, much more than normal. and he uh, made the comment how these cover crops were just fantastic that year and how some years they hardly ever grow. But that year, he said, it was just, he said, I can really see the, the difference that cover crops made in my soil. And, and I told him, I said, well, it was nice you were prepared for that, that you could be able to do that and take advantage of that opportunity. And in true Montana form, he said, yeah, you got to have your pistol cocked. And uh, I thought that was a good analogy, basically meaning you got to be ready. And when when the opportunity arises, you have to have the seeds in the ground or be ready to put the seeds in the ground if you happen to catch an unexpected one-inch rain or something. 
uh, like that. And that's what I mean by that. You've got to be ready to maximize that opportunity when it happens because it's not going to happen probably every year. So just in reflecting here, you know, that's wasted when you just don't plant anything. Uh, there's, there's so much, uh, you know, just is, is the opportunity that is lost in that. Now, um, also here, I wanted to show this because this was actually, you'll, you'll notice that field that's, that's a little bit greener, more or less in the foreground. And you notice the fence goes up on the right and then comes across the picture. That is management. Um, that happens to be a farmer who's been using cover crops for a while. He was actually renovated his past pasture by planting mixed species of you could call them cover crops, double uh, and doubling up as forage. Again, this was a, a situation where uh, he had sheep, and he said, "That's my neighbor's field on the on the far right and on the top." And he said, "You can just see the difference." And we actually walked over, and the difference was actually more more apparent when you looked at it close. But that, of course, the same amount of rainfall, and I don't know what his neighbor, his management of his sheep were, but it was just. That was just a picture there of management. And basically his point was keeping mixed species growing there, keeping the diversity even in his pasture uh, ground there. So that was just a an opportunity to see that. Now, most all my talk today is geared to there's where the non-irrigated areas. I wanted to show you this picture here. The, uh, again, Australia, uh, limited irrigation. They had... Uh, availability of, of some water and they basically their idea was dedicate the water that they had to getting the cover crop growing basically just to get it germinated and that's this is some of the plots that were, that were in there so again where water is limited or you, where you just don't have a lot of opportunity how do you uh, manage that and of course if it never gets started to grow it'll never grow so uh, their feeling was in years where they don't catch a timely rain, it, it paid them to uh, irrigate to get their cover crop coming up. So just looking at different uh, species of cover crops, which ones are better? Uh, this is, again, as a cover crop plot. Um, and I don't have the data on this in here of where uh, what the rainfall was, but obviously it is fairly dry. You can see. Some species are doing uh, better than others. Uh, then here is the one of the driest ones I saw. This literally was only one inch of rain in, in three months. Very little growth this year uh, in, in this situation here. So uh, you can look, if you look through the plot more on the left, the upper left-hand side, you'll see some that hardly grew at all. And... I did not get the the list of these species, but I do uh, remember, uh, I, I, and this is coming from, you know, my travels and so forth, what some of the better ones are, and there's nothing new on here. There's no magical drought-tolerant cover crop that, uh, that I'm aware of, um, but sorghum sedan looks strong. Uh, sun hemp is decent. Uh, some of the millets, there's a lot of different types of millets out there. Sunflowers seem to do well. Uh, all these have somewhat of an aggressive rooting, which makes sense. So this is some of the uh, ones you could plant in the summer. You could throw radishes in there in the summer if you wanted. Uh, in the fall, radishes always look fairly good uh, in these situations. Again, it's because of the taproot that can go down and find moisture. Uh, cereal rye is good. Some varieties of triticale. Uh, annual ryegrass, I was hesitating if I should put this up here or not. Uh, one reason is because a lot of dry land areas just don't like annual ryegrass because they, they typically be growing wheat there and it could become a weed. So that's why I left it off, but you may ask the question, annual ryegrass is a deep rooter. So in a dairy situation, uh, yeah, no, no, no problem there. Uh, cash grain, Small, small grains, you might want to be careful of putting on your ryegrass in this, in this, uh, in this type of a region. So what about cover crop seeding rates? I, I mentioned that. Um, this here farmer was very, very happy with this rate of radish. Uh, it was between, he wasn't sure, between one and two pounds an acre. That's about what it looked like. But that 
and, and again, someone has been growing cover crops for a while. Uh, so it, it's just in this case, um, his goal wasn't to have 100 percent foliage covered. You can see that there is still some residue left there. But the seeding rates can be dropped back significantly in the drier land areas. But it does come back to what you're trying to do. If it's forage, then you probably want to increase your seeding rates to accommodate that situation. Um, if you have enough of uh, residue there from a previous crop or residue, you know, you don't have to have 100% coverage because not only is it a seed saving cost, the biological effect, those roots go out, they go down, but they go out and they're in the soil profile. So they're doing, they're doing some good. And, um, I, I, this, I'm just giving a general statement here that, uh, in this case, lower seeding rates are pretty much a standard for low rainfall areas. I've heard someone say already, and I think this is just a guideline, but the amount you spend on a cover crop per acre can be correlated close to what your annual rainfall is. And it, and it works in American dollars. So uh, 20 inch rainfall, 20 bucks an acre is max. 30 inch rainfall, $30 an acre. So take that for whatever it's worth. It's just a really loose guideline. Uh, but anyway, uh, thought I'd mention that. Again, talking about species, uh, one of the things that was interesting is I saw this in several different fields. They're very, very dry. I literally used a screwdriver to dig this radish root out. I could not use a shovel. It was too dry. It was too hard. Uh, so, uh, again, this is about 18 inches deep. Not a lick of moisture there that I could tell. Uh, what was interesting is if you look on the picture on the right, that's canola or oilseed rape on the right. And the radishes on the left, two radishes and one canola. There was no, we, could, we couldn't find any canola plants that were, they were really getting down. Now, they were still alive, as you can see on that picture, but they weren't going down. What they were excited about, and this was new for me, is they have high potassium uh, in their subsoil. So they were, figured, they were excited about these radishes pulling up potassium that their cash crops never reach. They seemed to say they had some data on it. Uh, but, again, that was just uh, – and, and that soil type in that area – these radishes were getting down there, finding potassium and bringing it to the top. So again, that's just, what are you trying to accomplish? What's, what can your cover crops do? What can't they do? What's the limitations? All these factors are going to enter in from area to area, but, um, <clears throat> but it, it just, uh, it just, again, the importance of knowing what you're trying to accomplish is really important. 